Hello students, good afternoon to everyone. In next three hours, in next three hours, we are going to cover entire ancient Indian history, which will help you in coming prelims examination. This will give you overall idea about entire ancient India. You will have proper connections. So in a logical way, we will try to connect from the beginning of our Indian history till the end of ancient. In examination, if you have clarity over the chronology, many times, few questions just with the proper idea about the chronology itself, you will be able to answer. Some questions definitely you require in-depth knowledge, but some questions may require in-depth knowledge, depending on the quality of the question paper and the difficulty level of the question paper. But sometimes, just by knowing the chronology, which dynasty came first, which dynasty came later, you will be able to arrive at the answer. For that purpose, and it is also going to be a quick revision for you to handle entire ancient history in fast way. Let us start. In this class, we are going to use even this also. Map also, because everything is interconnected. Without geography, we cannot do anything with respect to history. History is all about various developments that have taken place in this geographic location. So we are talking about ancient Indian history, ancient times. Today, we have three different countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, four countries. But once upon a time, all these areas were under single authority. That's why we call Indian subcontinent. Up to here, we are going to deal in this part of geographic land, different things happen. And if you track in sequential way, chronological way, you'll be able to answer many questions just by having idea about chronology. We can use respect to whatever either political or physical, according to the need. Let us start. First, with respect to ancient Indian history, first I am trying to give you the chronology, how you have to look at it. Chronology. First, Stone Age. It was the age when human beings don't know how to write. They were using the stone tools for their sustenance. And after Stone Age, Metal Age. Later, human beings started learning how to use the metal. Copper was the first metal used by human beings. In India also, we have certain areas where copper was utilized. After copper, then in certain areas, copper was mixed with tin, then it gave a new alloy called bronze. After that, people utilized iron, iron technology, iron metal also started using. Broadly, if you see the technology wise, Stone Age and Metal Age, when it comes to Stone Age, we have three different Paleolithic age. Paleo means old. Lithic means stone. So it is about old Stone Age. Next one, we have Neolithic. Neo means new. Lithic means stone. So old Stone Age and new Stone Age. Depending on the technology, what they have used, our historians have segregated it into old Stone Age and new Stone Age. However, any kind of age will not transfer or immediately will not change to other age suddenly. It takes some time. It's a gradual process. 
for example ancient traditions suddenly will not move into medieval traditions you will find a gap that gap are slow process that in the middle part we call early medieval period so ancient on one hand medieval on the other hand in between early medieval age similarly paleolithic and neolithic all of a sudden all the old traditions will not enter into new age new traditions that's why we consider mesolithic meso means middle middle stone age this way if we take metal chalcolithic age chalcolithic the term chalco comes from copper lithic means stone so it is a combination of both copper as well as stone tools combination utilized by the people for their livelihood then iron age iron age this is what with respect to metal then historic period with respect to iron age here it is not clear cut that after paleolithic mesolithic age comes after mesolithic neolithic age comes after neolithic chalcolithic age after chalco iron age but given the geographic area this is what you need to see chronology wise one development after the other development took place but indian geography is a very vast one very huge territory in every place all people did not move from paleolithic to mesolithic all people from mesolithic people did not enter into neolithic in every part of the country that is why in some places while people are living in neolithic stage neolithic stone age some people advanced into chalcolithic age because of geographic locations some people are advanced in nature they used to move at get the technology very fast and they used to move advance in a very fast way that's why when some people are living in stone age some people lived in cities also for example harappan in some parts of india people were still living in villages whereas harappan people lived in cities this is because of the geographical extent that is why these clear cut timeline we cannot see we will see later next historic period when it comes to historic period the period from which script started people started using the script based on that script we divide history into two parts prehistoric age and historic period generally in our indian history from vedic period onwards this historic period starts then after peri vedic period in vedic we have early vedic next later vedic period after vedic period maha janapadas maha janapadas kingdoms established now if i give certain timeline for example let me consider from historic period here history can be divided prehistory proto history historic period so prehistoric period proto historic period and historic period when it comes to historic period vedic age onwards we consider 
historic period. Vedic age starts from 1500 BC, and from that time period onwards, early Vedic, later Vedic, Mahajanapadas, likewise. Prehistory means Stone Age. But there is a peculiar development when it comes to Indian subcontinent. That is, from this period onwards, we have written records, script. We are reconstructing history based on the written records. But some part, we have script available. but not deciphered it. For certain period, for certain culture in our Indian history, we discovered script, but we are not able to read it, what exactly the meaning of that script. That is why we cannot categorize this historic period as prehistory, because script is available. They know how to write. If they know how to write, that should be part of historic period. But we are not able to decipher and we are not able to extract the information about their culture from the writing. That's why we consider it as proto-historic period. This is Indus Valley Civilization is the best example. In this example, here we know script is there, but we are not able to, not able to read it. From Vedic period onwards, historic period, Proto history and prehistory. Now I will give you the broad timeline. From this period onwards, at least we have certain timeline. Let us see this. Vedic period. So in Vedic period, suppose 1500 BC to 600 BC is the Vedic period. In within Vedic period, we have early Vedic period, 1500 to 1000 BC. Later Vedic period, 1000 BC to 600 BC. Next. So before Vedic period, we have Indus Valley Civilization, Stone Age. Like these kind of titles, these kind of headings or the timeline cannot be given exactly to Indus Valley Civilization, but broadly accepted thing is, accepted timeline, 2500 BC to 1800 or 1750 BC. This is the peak stage of that civilization, declined by 1750 altogether. And before that, Chalcolithic, Neolithic, Mesolithic, and before that, Paleolithic. But one problem here comes in different geographic locations, different timelines. Vedic period, then the age of Maha Janapadas. After Vedic time period, after later Vedic time period, age of Mahajanapadas, 600 BC onwards, it will start. And one of the Mahajanapadas, Magadha, it became the first empire. Mahajanapadas talks about kingdoms. Then from those kingdoms, one kingdom emerged as a major powerful empire, Magadha. Different dynasties ruled Magadha. Mauryans were the one who literally brought almost entire Indian subcontinent under them. That's why we consider as a separate area, age, Mauryan age or Mauryan period. This is around 321 BC. Then after Mauryans, post-Mauryan period. So this timeline is 
200 BCE to 300 AD. Now we can see 1500 BC to 600 BC Vedic, 600 to 300 Mahajanapadas, Mauryan age 300 to 185. We can consider till 185 BC. Post Mauryan transition period 200 BC to 300 AD. Then after that, Gupta period, 319, 322, 550 AD. After Guptas, next, post Guptas. Post Guptas, we can consider from 550 to 750. Then after 750, early medieval period starts. early medieval, so 750 to 1200. So we started around 1500 BCE, early medieval and set 1280. This is how we can see the chronology wise. So if I talk on time scale, 1500 BC. 1000 BC, 600 BC, 321 BC, 200 BC, 300 AD. Five fifty AD, seven fifty, twelve hundred. So likewise, we can have. 1500 to 1000, early Vedic period, 1000 to later Vedic period, Mahajanapadas, then Mauryans, post Mauryan, Guptas, post Gupta, early medieval period. And before it, Indus Valley Civilization, Stone Age, here, exact timelines we cannot give, that we will see now. So this is how different timelines. Now we will understand, we are going for this map. In this map we will understand how developments started. Now from this side to that end of the spectrum, continuous developments are taking place. Even today also, in the present day, 2023, whatever we have, whatever society we are living in, whatever economic system we are living in, whatever technology, whatever religion, whatever culture, our food habits, our dressing pattern, festivals, dance, music, religious beliefs, all these have the roots in this time scale. At some point of time in our history, these developments started, and from that time period onwards, they are continuously progressing, and today we are seeing in the final shape what we are practicing. Our future generation will get the same kind of culture in a different way. Same thing, they will also study about ourselves. 20, after 100 years, they will study about us also. Likewise, we need to study what happened in the ancient past. With, re with respect to prelims questions, just by knowing this chronology also, sometimes you can guess. For example, if one, two, three statements are there, if they give certain kind of development which happened in Guptas, if statement says that particular practice started in Vedic, you can simply eliminate it by logical analysis. That's why we need to track all these developments in a chronological way, in a systematic way, so that you will understand, to be, you will remember it. You can write the examination, you can get the score in prelims.
Let us start with map. This is present day India. Here, Bangladesh, it was also part of Mauryan Empire. This side, Pakistan, Afghanistan area also once part of Mauryan Empire during Mughal time period also. But for today's reference, we are taking like this. Now, when it comes to Stone Age, today we are talking about different technologies, advanced technologies, computers, computers advancing, when it comes to telecommunication, 2G done, 3G, 4G, 5G, they are evolving. In the initial stage, people were completely living on the nature. For them, the technology means whatever stones that are available for them. If we take the beginning, the evolution of human beings, So from Africa, so it is generally accepted that the modern form of human beings evolved from Africa and from there they migrated in all the directions. That is how they spread across the world and they came to India as well. But in the human evolution itself, it is not all of a sudden people started inventing the script started living in cities, started building the empires, kingdoms, different art and architecture. Initially, they were living in the hunting stage. They were hunter and gatherers, completely living on the nature. This stage we call Paleolithic stage. Paleolithic, in our Indian history, up to 12,000 BC, or 10,000 BC. Between 12,000 to 10,000 BC, there was change in the climate also. Climate change. So before 10,000 BC, we consider the people who were living before 10,000 BC, we regard them as Paleolithic, Old Stone Age. He in this for these people, large stones. They used large stones for hunting and gathering. Hunting plus gathering. So main, their main purpose just to live and moreover, before 10,000 BC, the climate was very cold. That age was also called Pleistocene. I will keep underlining, I will keep highlighting, which are important for prelims. So while you are re listening, you can listen the narration, you can listen the story at the same time have some special attention to those which I am going to highlight. These sentences will appear in the examination as part of prelims, MCQs. They used large stone. The purpose of these stone tools, because they are living in this stage, primitive stage, hunters and gatherers. Climate also very cold. Now you can see entire area was completely covered with ice. This area was completely covered with ice. It becomes very difficult for the people to sustain in that environment condition. So it is from this part near Ethiopia, before Homo sapiens evolved, then they started migrating. And somewhere from Morocco, they moved to Europe from here, Saudi Arabia, and finally, India. From this, they spread to this, 
and here here and here here you will see some kind of little bit some connection from there they entered into north america and south america as well so that is how people from africa in the initial stage in the initial stage you cannot expect the technology which will cross which will make the people to cross from here to here it is impossible at that time that's why they had to move from land one land to the other land these people have come to this part of the world through this way now this is how in your geography that's why you to understand history geographic knowledge is also very very crucial they crossed here and that's how entire world they spread completely covered with ice before 10000 and only those animals big animals which can sustain that cold climate survive people have to depend on that only those animals for food that's how they required large stone technology at that time we are calling them as technology but for them it is the only mechanism to live so large stones subsistence please to see age after 10000 bc climate change this is what even today also we are talking about climate change now you see what happens if climate changes completely it will change the life of the people itself it completely alter the lifestyle of the people that's why after this climate become warmer climate change temperatures increased it was pleistocene you remember this the term pleistocene ice age from ice age temperatures increased became warmer now you see whenever there is rise in temperature gradually the snow melts humidity in the environment increases rainfall increases because of snow melt now most of the areas are cleared from snow they became like pasture grounds now this due to this now due to this environmental changes now you see geographical changes as a result how people also adapt to the new changes becomes warmer more humidity rise in temperature humidity rainfall now ice cleared when ice is cleared soil is exposed to the environment pasture grounds because of continuous rainfall you will find different lakes also now these lakes are grounds fishing grounds now you can see this is how geography in history there is a question how geography determines the history of a place now see after climate change 10000 bc temperatures increased and all these natural changes are taking place as a result people were earlier depending on hunting and gathering people were living in caves now when it comes to this side people can find food in other areas now the food pattern itself changes fishing became one important subsistence so here subsistence pattern this age we call mesolithic age mesolithic middle stone age fishing people started domesticating animals domestication of animals now it doesn't mean they stopped hunting and gathering continuously they are doing along with that hunting and gathering also
on one hand they are continuing the hunting and gathering and at the same time new vet new way of life also began so hunting and gathering continued domestication of animals fishing became additional subsistence patterns you remember this with respect to mesolithic age and for this the technology large stone tools they continued but at the same time they need not to worry about large stone tools they started making micro tools small small micro tools they can fit these micro stone tools to the bows arrows they used and they were used for domestication and fishing purpose wild rice or wild grains wild grains also now you see change in the temperature as a result cropping pattern or the natural vegetation also changes vegetation changes wild grains started coming and people started understanding the importance of wild grains they collected and they were tried to utilize it from large stone tools hunting gathering pleistocene and this was also the age they invented fire so fire is paleolithic this is how now when it comes to mesolithic age fishing domestication micro stone tools these are the developments that happened during mesolithic time period likewise now from 10000 bc a 9000 8000 7000 after 2000 3000 years naturally you will see some more changes in the environment now more more soil exposed to the environment now gradually people started learning like earlier people were hunting animals later they domesticated animals in mesolithic they were collecting the grains now they started domesticating the grains that is called indirectly we are calling it as agriculture this is the stage neolithic age new stone age the major character stake is agriculture so agriculture question can be asked agriculture is associated with paleolithic statement yes or no it is wrong statement agriculture is associated with neolithic age neolithic age agriculture is associated with neolithic age very very important now you can understand after 10000 bc new climate continuously change in the environment is taking place gradual evolution now people started learning how to start domesticating the crops also agriculture when it comes to stone tools in paleolithic they were large stones boulders very crude in nature when it comes to mesolithic according to the requirement they made small small stone tools but by neolithic they started polishing the stones for example a stone tool called celt it is like a sickle type and these stone tools were utilized for growing the crops so according to this profession subsistence pattern according to this subsistence pattern they started making these technologies they started growing crops 
whatever crops we are eating today like wheat rice and cotton clothes these have the beginnings in neolithic age so this is how this is how history helps us to understand what is the importance of knowing about our history so crops now people learn once they are growing the crops they have to store it otherwise if they are not if they don't have any mechanism to store these crops during rainy season it becomes difficult to again get the food to store the food for rainy season and winter season which where crops are not they are not able to grow the crops for lean season they have to store it pottery and in fact pottery started in mesolithic age itself but this pottery is handmade and this pottery is wheel made so that means wheel wheel also invented pottery wheel made pottery once wheel comes everything revolutionized transportation system itself changed completely so this transportation system help people to move from one place to the other place and now if you are practicing agriculture you need to settle at least for one season to grow the crops so people they are producing the crops and nearby this they are settling so this is how now season after the season season of the season they were growing and now these settlements emerged into village so villages for the first time transportation wheel pottery wheel made crops agriculture so these are even today also most of bharat in our current affairs also we used to study there are two types of india one is india another one is bharat just to represent that india means modern which is urban in nature bharat means which is rural in nature still most of us still are living in rural areas and this is how you can trace our indian society started living in villages from neolithic time period onwards so agriculture village setup growing crops all these are characteristics of neolithic settlements now if we see in different parts of india there are some places these places can be potential mcqs for example there were there was a place bori in maharashtra bimbetka adamgad karnool caves son valley these are some of the places son valley bimbetka adamgar bori there is one more place called hatnora these areas bimbetka adamgar hatnora are in madhya pradesh bori is in maharashtra karnool caves in andhra pradesh this is in present day pakistan son valley in these places whatever the large stone tools paleolithic people we don't have evidence of any written records 
we have to know about these people from the stone tools which they utilized from these places we got certain stone tools which belong to paleolithic in some places we have skulls for example hathnora skull they give the evidence that paleolithic stage people that means before 10000 bc before 10000 bc people were living in indian subcontinent so this is what evidence these are the areas these are important for prelims point of view they can ask bori is match the following or bori is associated with bimbetka adamgar hathnora so these are some of the sites remaining sites in ncert just to go through the map you will get remaining sites also these are the important sites which you need to remember important sites for paleolithic next one gradually here there is one more place called belan valley here mesolithic gradually people started knowing about domestication of animals fishing so here domestication of animals fishing collecting the wild grains this are all part of mesolithic microliths so in some places like bilan valley we identified microliths we come to the conclusion that mesolithic people lived here this is up to paleolithic and mesolithic now next map is very very crucial when it comes to the neolithic stage because neolithic is the one which is associated with agriculture rural areas village setup wheel because these are the revolutionaries in terms of completely altering the life of the people itself that's why up to neolithic they were living in one kind of life after invention of the wheel agriculture village setup completely a new way of culture civilization emerged later that's why a scholar called gordon child he considered these developments as neolithic revolution neolithic revolution we gordon child because of completely altering revolutionary it's like uh, the modern day artificial intelligence it may transfer completely the people's lives so that is how at that time invention of the wheel agriculture domestication of animals into the new level completely alter the life of the people we need to know in which places we identified neolithic this is important when it comes to prelims if we consider in our indian subcontinent we considered mehargad it is the place located in the present day pakistan region this area around 7000 bc whatever neolithic characters that just i explained these kind of traits were identified in this location mehargad mehargad is the place this is neolithic now you will see some of the places these places are very very important for prelims match the following they used to give match the following and once match the following comes different states they can ask different type of traits they can ask mehargad here when it comes to jammu and kashmir burj hom gofkral 
Neolithic, this is around 2500 BC. Now you see the difference in timeline also. Around 7000 BC itself, these people started living in villages. They grown the crops. For example, they have grown the crops like wheat, cotton. Probably in the world itself, growing crop probably first time by Mehargad people. Wheat. Now you see, when these people are living in villages, in other parts people are still living in Paleolithic style, hunting, gathering or Mesolithic life. That's why you need to see, because of these differences only, when it comes to in India, Neolithic, we give range of timeline from 7000 BC to 1000 BC. Now you see, when it comes to Vedic period, we have 1500 to 1000 BC. Before 1000 itself, Vedic age started, early Vedic period. But at the same time, in different other parts, around 1000 BC, Neolithic stage only some people are living in. That's why you should be very careful in understanding timeline and the chronology. Burjaham Gufrakal, here around 5000 BC, Bilan Valley, like Koldiva, here it is having the Mesolithic age itself, they started life, and it is also the place where rice for the first time grown, Rice for the first time in Indian subcontinent in this location. Cotton, wheat for the first time in Indian subcontinent in this location. Here, Davao jelly heading in northeast. This is around 1000 BC, Neolithic stage. When it comes to here, Deccan, around 3000 to 2500 BC onwards from 3000 to 2500 and continue, it continued for the next uh, time periods. In this area, different, uh, these are called Neolithic, at the same time these people also utilized copper technology. That's why they are also called Neolithic, Chalcolithic, like Brahmagiri, Utnur, Kupgal. So some of the areas, Halur. Just if you see the map of NCRT, just you can get the other remaining sites also. Because I cannot draw everything here. Mehargad, 7000. Gufrikal, Burjham, J and K. Northeast, 1000, 7000, 5000, 3000. You can see, because of various geographical locations, huge tracts, because of it, Indian subcontinent is having different uh, Neolithic traditions in different points of time. That's why we give the range 1000, 7000 to 1000 BC. Next one. Now you can see, among all these periods, this is advanced. But naturally, you can expect these people will again improve further into more advanced level, they started using copper. They started using, now they moved from like large stone, Paleolithic, to the micro tools, Mesolithic, polished tools in Neolithic, now they started moving to the copper. And after some time, they started learning how to mix copper with tin so that they can make even better metal alloy that is bronze. 
with branch technology copper technology these people gradually moved from village level to the urban areas for the first time in indian history first urban revolution or urbanization started first urbanization in india this we call indus valley civilization now you see how how our history paleolithic to meso to meso to neo neo to urban areas this is the sequence sequence of evolution in the rest of the time period just it is going to be the same sequence we need to pick up as many facts as possible for the history for the examination so first urbanization potential question for mcq potential question for prelims in our indian history first urbanization means indus valley civilization now when it comes to indus valley civilization we have some facts we have to know what is the extent of this indus valley civilization from which area to which area it survived so i am drawing only this side because this part is more crucial extent means now for example we are drawing these boundaries why we are drawing india like this because this is the area of present day modern india republic indian republic is having the territories like this that's why we are drawing india map like this at that time the indus valley people almost had in this area they were living if we see the boundaries the northern most manda in jammu and kashmir here eastern most alamgirpur present day uttar pradesh in maharashtra southern most daimabad maharashtra daimabad here sudgajender this is another part manda alamgirpur daimabad sudgajender so this is western most northern most eastern southern so this is the extent now it is natural that mehargad around 7000 bc itself people started living in living in rural areas village setup was there they know how to manufacture the pottery with wheel wheel was invented pottery also transportation system now they started utilizing the resources of the water indus river now this river helped them to produce more agriculture more surplus and more surplus means more taxation people now some people started living on agriculture some people they were trying to take the other professions like industry artisan activities so people started learning how to now different people population is also growing in hunting stage gathering stage very risky time period and you can see the food also is different mortality rate increases but now when it is settled life mortality rate decreases now more population increases by this time people already started learning about is some kind of medicinal characters also they know how to cure the diseases also 
better medical facilities. Now comparing with the independence time period, today India's life expectancy is more because of advancements in the medicine. Similarly, these people also learned how to live longer time, more population. That's why some people agriculture, some people industry, some people trading activities. Likewise, different professions emerged. This Indus Valley civilization, this is the boundary. Now they had interaction with internally also. There are so many such places within this boundary. Harappa, Mohanjodaro, Chanhudaro, Kalibangan, Banwali, Dholavira, Lodal. Likewise, so many cities emerged. So many people settled in different areas. Now you can see many people living in urban areas. These urban areas having strong industrial base. This industrial base was flourishing on top of agriculture. They know trading activities. Internally, they were trading. And at the same time, they were trading with other parts of the world also. International trade. So if we take this map, this area, this area is Indus Valley Civilization. These people were trading over land also, over seas also. This is Mesopotamia, Indus Valley Civilization. Indus Valley Civilization, Mesopotamia. Mesopotamians even called Indus people with a name called Meluha. So Mesopotamians called Indians with a name called Meluha. Whatever I have written here, all these places' names can be important for prelims' point of view. Meluha is the name given by Mesopotamians to Indians at the time in the Valley civilization. Now, what is the timeline? What we give is it flourished from 2500 BC. Now, you see, in Mehargad, 7000 BC, from 7,000, 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, from villages to stone, Neolithic stage to the Chalcolithic stage, copper started. And people started mixing copper with the tin. And now these people started using, using bronze. By 2,500 BC, they became very powerful and all their institutions were very strong. And as a result, they were able to produce large cities, and most impressive part of this Indus Valley civilization is remarkable similarity in the town planning. The way Harappa is designed is almost similar to the way Mohanjodaro, Chanhudaro, Dholavir, Kalibangan. All these have certain kind of similar town structure that is very remarkable. Living in towns, definitely a remarkable one at this point of time. The most other striking aspect is these cities have again having the similarities, similar big brick structure. So the size of the bricks, almost similar. The kind of drainage system, almost similar. The kind of grid system in the city planning, town planning is almost similar. The division of city, almost similar. Some areas were in the upper mound, citadel, some area in the lower, similar pattern in different places. This is what most striking part. That means some kind of connection must be there, some kind of organized way of administration should have been there. So all these things will come from our Indus Valley civilization. Just you remember these places. 
Harappa is the now till 1921 we don't know that our India is having this rich tradition. Before 19, during British time period only this Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic and Indus Valley civilization they came to the light. Before that we were believing and because it's natural our history means we whatever we study so our history means before 1921 or before the British historic period Vedic age here we have Vedas so whatever Vedas were giving the information Indians were thinking that is the beginning of our India's history but because of the discovery of Indus Valley civilization, our age, our ancestry pushed back to many thousands of years back. And 1921. Now you see, up to here we were talking from Vedic age, go back to Vedas. Dayananda Saraswati also used to say, go back to Vedas. Because he was at that time, he was active in 1860s, 1870s, 1870s, 1875, Dayanand Saraswati established Arya Samaj. At that time, it was very common that our history started from Vedic age, the beginning of our history. He used to say, go back to Vedas and back to Vedic culture. Probably, had he known Indus Valley Civilization, he would have told, go back to Indus Valley Civilization, because it is much older than Vedic period. But this was discovered only in 1921. That's why our ancestry, our history itself was pushed back to this side. Now, in some areas with the stone tools, with the latest technologies, carbon dating method, we come to know that Stone Age also, in different places in India, people were living in prehistoric age also. This is Stone Age. So this is how in 1921, we come to know that there are remarkable cities that were in existence in Indian subcontinent in 2500, but by 1750, they declined completely. So during this time period, 2500 to 1750, these cities were in very much active. Now, let us see some important developments. For example, some factual part for prelims examination. Harappa. This Indus Valley civilization is also we call Harappan civilization. The name Harappa, Harappa comes from this particular town called Harappa. This is located on the river Ravi. Ravi is a tributary of Indus. On river Ravi it is located. It was the first site to be discovered and it is giving a lot of evidence like town planning evidence, granaries, that means administrators are living here, collected taxes. These taxes probably in the form of grains, and these grains were stored in granaries. So Harappa. Next, Mohenjo-daro. On the banks of river Indus. Earlier it was considered as the largest settlement of Indus Valley. Earlier, Mohanjodara was considered as the largest settlement. Now, it is replaced with another place in Haryana, Rakhi Garhi. Haryana, largest settlement. So, Rahi Garhi is the largest settlement now. But earlier, Mohanjodara was the largest one. 
Next, same thing. Town planning, granary, great bath, bronze dancing girl, image. These are the some of the evidences we got. Next, Chanhudaro. Chanhudaro is famous for bead industry. So you can see advancement in industry. Next, Lodal. Lodal is known for dockyard. It is located in Gujarat. Lodal is known for dockyard. Dockyard means it is a port. That port you to used for exports as well as imports. So Lodal port, Mohenjadaro, Chanhudaro, Harappa. These are important one with respect to prelims point of view. Where is dockyard is located? Where dockyard located? Lodal. What is the first site? Harappa. Bead industry famous in Chanhudaro. Largest settlement, Rocky Garhi. So likewise, in Haryana, we have a place called Banawali. This Banawali is known for barley evidence. So barley grains were recovered. This shows they knew barley crop. Because prelims point of view, you need to know these things. Then Raki Garhi. This is known as the largest. Next, Rajasthan. Kalibangan. This Kalibangan means, the meaning of Kalibangan is black bangles. It is known for altars, fire altars. So probably they were doing some kind of sacrifices or worshipping fire. Kalibangan, fire altars. Next, furrowed land. For agriculture, we need to plow the land. These people did not use iron. Probably they have, they have used wooden plow that did not sustain, survive now. But this furrowed land gives the evidence that how they practiced agriculture. Next, Gujarat, Dholavira. Dholavira is known for water reservoir. Water reservoir, they constructed reservoirs. This shows Dholavira. This is located near to Gulf of Kutch. In Gulf of Kutch is a saline area, drought prone area, they near to desert, very difficult. And they for getting the water. In that circumstance, having this technology, construction of water reservoir. Next one, Lodal, we have seen. Dockyard. There is one more place called Rangpur. Here, rice. So rice, barley, barley evidence, Banawali. Rice evidence, Rangpur. Dockyard, water reservoir, furrowed land, fire altars, like this. You need to remember the different places in different states. When it comes to the extent we have seen in Jammu and Kashmir, Manda, UP, Alamgirpur, Maharashtra, Daimabad. All these are different facts you need to remember. But if you try to understand, the places are very, very important to understand the development that happened during this period. So these are the places. Now up to here, we consider it as proto-historic. Because these people, 
they know even script also script they know but we are at to decipher it in a place called dholavira 10 letter sign board was discovered dholavira 10 letter sign board on many seals script was there and these seals themselves will give so much information about the their life their religion proto shiva seal proto shiva seal was identified this is containing shiva in yogic posture later time period today also yoga is very important part of our integral part of our culture during indus valley civilization itself that kind of position already practiced by so this shows those people knew yogic postures different animals animals like tiger elephant rhinoceros buffalo it is very interesting to know that after indus valley people vedic people came during vedic time period cow was very important one but when it comes to <coughs> indus valley civilization cow was not given that kind of importance it was not represented seals religion when it comes to religion when it comes to religion they were believing in tree worship like people tree then proto shiva that means human worship mother goddess mother goddess worship next one animal worship serpents even they were believing in amulets amulets means some kind of tools which are used for warding off evils to control evils now you see whatever beliefs today also we have have the origin in indus valley civilization so these are all you need to see but there are no large temples no large temples very very important no large temples that means these people were secular religion was their private affair even though great bath was there from mahanjodaro but there is no large scale temple architecture the contemporaries of indus valley people mesopotamians they were having temples but when it comes to indus valley civilization there is no such kind of thing so secular religion was a private affair because today we are talking so much about secularism and in our ancient past indus valley people were secular people they were having religious beliefs at the private level decline when it comes to decline there is no clarity how these kind of huge cities how they decline some say aryan invasion that these people are living in cities new migrants from in this location
these people came and here indus valley civilization they are living in cities and these were called aryans these aryans defeated them violently there were wars and battles and finally they completely displaced the original indus valley people either they killed invaded and these people were occupied and these people moved away from this area that is what one theory aryan invasion theory aryan invasion theory british archaeologists mortimer wheeler he propagated this aryan invasion theory but there is no sufficient evidence to show that aryans invaded this area and completely uprooted them displaced them next one ecological disasters like floods earthquakes not a single incident destroyed these cities but gradually whenever there is a climate change change in the climate is continuously is to take place like 10000 bc ago climate change happened new type of pattern emerged around this time period around 1700 1800 1900 time period erratic rainfall because these people are living in agriculture continuously grown the crops the fertility of the soil decreased and they utilized the river also over exploitation the deforestation took place as a result rainfall pattern changed rainfall pattern changed once rainfall pattern changes now you need to see sometimes river beds may dry sometimes whenever there is huge rain rivers will overflow and on the river beds also people occupied and now some settlements on the river beds gradually they settlements also flooded now town planning when it comes to town planning these people were having this kind of town planning in this area administrators common people here citadel lower town upper town and lower town this is what town planning grid system houses were constructed properly drainage system also maintained but gradually these changes gradually disappeared and they moved to the new areas because cities will flourish only when agriculture or rural areas are well connected with the cities whenever rural areas are under threat they cannot supply the food grains and other essential elements which are required for the town people naturally town people also migrate rural people also migrated because of the change in the fertility and climate gradually they moved towards these areas so this area was the one the core area is this from this they moved they migrated to different places so it is mostly accepted this ecological changes ecological changes ecological principles or ecological damages that be to economic activities of the indus people that the damage they have done to the nature caused floods as a result droughts floods people were not able to 
practice agriculture the way intensely like they were doing earlier gradually they left the cities and moved to the new areas and now when they move from one area to the other areas the culture carried their religious beliefs for example proto shiva shiva later important god in the indian history yoga important uh, cultural practice mother goddess in indian history is there script later this script brahmi script emerged in the gangetic valley again indirect influence some of the historians this indus valley civilization became the foundation for the dravidian culture by this time aryans migrated around 1500 bc they migrated to this area by that time already indus valley people they abandoned their cities and they moved to the new areas that's why aryan invasion theory was discarded ecological disaster theory was accepted as the main theory behind this so this is how by this time paleolithic people mesolithic people neolithic people chalcolithic people indus valley people all these people have certain beliefs certain social elements economic practices cultural practices beliefs systems already established in the indian subcontinent now in addition to that aryan culture also comes this we call early vedic early vedic period 1500 to 1000 bc we consider early vedic the main geographic location is saptasindhwa now you see the culture is just is going to be one after the other our indian culture is going to be enriched by various ideas now we need to pick up as many facts as possible already some foundation by paleolithic people mesolithic people neolithic people indus valley people now in addition to that new way of life new way of thoughts new way of culture everything comes some more elements will get added to the previous generation sapta sindhwa is the geography we know about these people from a text called rigveda so the most general accepted theory is at this present moment is there were people in central asian steppes central asian steppes in geography you will study these steppes are very harsh if there is no rainfall very meager resources domestication of animals is the main profession steppes these are grasslands if there is any delay in the rainfall or if there is no rain the conditions of this area becomes very difficult now if you see this wherever you see the green color that means forest area resources are available plain area or green area where people can produce people get the food wherever you see the brown color these are desert areas now you see sahara desert saudi arabia desert iranian desert central asia also this area is drought prone area very little rainfall very difficult to survive that's why continuous wars and battles used to take place in this for limited resources and the people used to migrate to the new areas they used to migrate towards china they used to migrate towards india this migration is very common throughout our history if you see the homo sapiens or the modern man they started moving from this location to different areas in search of food similarly people will keep on look for food 
and better opportunities throughout our history. Now, for the first time in our history, in Indian history, we consider Aryan migration is a major one. And when this happened, by this time, Indus Valley civilization already declined. These people migrate to the new areas. And those people who are already settling in the Indus places, they were also living in the they were also living in the villages. That's why by the time Aryans came and settled in the Saptasindhwa River, almost these people are not living in urban areas, but in the rural areas. Saptasindhwa, we know about the information from Rig Veda. Society was tribal character, Territory is not important one. Jana was important one. When it comes to political setup, chief was called Rajan. Their main property at this time was cattle, Praja. The functions of Raja were to protect cattle and people. People Jana and Praja and Pashu are the two aspects where Rajan was supposed to protect. No monarchical system, no hereditary system. Later, it became, when it comes to later Vedic time period, it is about to come. Political system, Rajan. Rajan was supported by chief priest Purohit. And the Rajan was also elected by the people, assemblies, political assemblies like Sabha, Samiti, Vidata, Gana. So these are the various assemblies that were there when early Vedic period was. So we are talking about the developments in Indian history from 1500 to 1000 BC. We know about all this information from Rig Veda. That's why early Vedic period is also called Rig Vedic period. Assemblies, polity. When it comes to economy, their main subsistence pattern is domestication of animals. Pastoralism. Agriculture was there, but limited. They used to produce a crop called Yava. This is akin to barley. Barley was the crop. Yava, they called. This term comes from Rig Veda. And they also used tools, metal, called Ayas. They called metal called ayas. Probably it is copper metal or bronze. So copper or bronze. You will remember these terms. Eva, ayas, sabha, samiti, vidata, gana. This is the economic system. When it comes to social system, kulapa was the head of the family. Then family is the basic unit. Joint family was there. Women conditions were better comparing with the later stage, liberal. And they were allowed politically in Sabha Samiti. And they were given education also. Some of the women in Vedic time period, even composed some hymns in Rig Veda. More liberal, educated, politically also in Sabha, Samiti, Vedata, Gana, they used to participate. They can choose their own husbands in marriage also. They have the freedom. 
That's why when it comes to modern time period, when social religious reform movements were going on, Dayananda Saraswati called, go back to Vedas. So he meant to this stage of life, where women were given respectable position, given equal treatment. Religion. Now when it comes to religious beliefs, religious beliefs, it is very natural that they were living on at the mercy of environment, nature. So they could not understand how rains are coming, how water is formed, how thunders are coming. They personified the nature. Personification. For example, Indra, god of thunder. Varuna, god of water. He was also called the upholder of Rita, means moral law. Dharma, moral law, he was the upholder, Varuna. Agni, Agni is considered as the intermediary between human beings and gods. Sacrifices, some rituals. The sacrifices are not very elaborate at this time, not like a later Vedic time period, at this time simple rituals. Indra, Varuna, Agni. Then other gods like Soma, some minor gods, Vishnu, Rudra, these are very minor gods. In later Vedic time period, they are going to become very powerful one. These people are going to become Dikpalakas. These people become, these gods become some minor gods. Whatever, whoever minor gods in Vedic period, early Vedic period, they become some major gods in later Vedic time period. Religious. Now gradually, from this area, they gradually move to the Gangetic Valley. So these people, by later Vedic time period, this is from 1000 BC to 600 BC. So this is Rig Veda, Rig Vedic period. 1500 to 1000 BC. This is called later Vedic time period. By this time, we know about this information from other Vedas. Ajur Veda, Adarva Veda, Sama Veda. These people composed or compiled other Vedas also. Rigveda was compiled in Indus, near Indus, this Gangetic Valley, Ganga Yamuna. Ganga Yamuna Valley, Gangetic Valley. In this area, Ajur Veda, Adarva Veda, Sama Veda, Brahmanas, Upanishads, Aranyakas, they were all composed during this time period, 1000 BC to 600 BC. It is also the time Mahabharata in this area, Ramayana. Epics. So it is believed that Mahabharata epic and Ramayana epics, they also, the story of Ramayana and Mahabharata also happened during this time period. Now by this time period, now you see, already now you need to consider, you need to remember the other parts. Paleolithic age, Mesolithic, Neolithic, 
చాలుకోలిథిక్ ఇండస్ వ్యాలీ పీపుల్ హూ మైగ్రేటెడ్ టు దీస్ ప్లేసెస్ లేట్ హరప్పన్ ఇన్ ఎర్లీ వేదిక్ టైం పీరియడ్ వేదిక్ సో వేదిక్ ప్రాక్టీసెస్ so when it comes to history you need to keep track of these developments this is how when it comes to upsc sometimes factual part direct chronology or some names associated with that particular development sometimes the statements of upsc are going to be very analytical you can understand these analytical statements by following the chronology clearly any culture suddenly will not develop any culture is going to be the continuation of existing previous culture with some modifications new ideas new modifications but altogether it not going to be very new definitely the old ideas will have influence on the new ideas as well that's why paleolithic mesolithic neo chalco these ideas you can call these people called themselves as aryans other people who are not following the rigvedic traditions or who are not looking like aryans they called them as non aryans sometimes they have given non aryans with dasa dasyus panis different names aryans have given different names to non aryans but altogether the influence of non aryans the aryans are not isolated definitely non aryan ideas also entered into aryan life in rigvedic practices now these contains some of the influences of non aryan lives as well for example samaveda is musical composition of rigveda and ajurveda adharveda particularly ajurveda contains about agnyas adharva veda contains magic magical spells magics and aranyakas they were considered as forest books now you see tribal people non tribals non aryans paleolithic mesolithic neolithic people traditions they these ideas also gradually entered into for example non aryan aryan language is sanskrit by the time later vedic time period ke non sanskrit letters words also entered into vedic literature so you remember ajurveda adharveda samaveda now rigveda hymns these are the praisings of gods samaveda deals with music ajurveda deals with rituals adharva veda deals with magic magical spells these are called vedas upavedas also emerged for example associated upaveda is dhanurveda associated upaveda to samaveda is gandharva veda associated upaveda to ajurveda rituals shilpa veda associated to adharva veda this ayurveda now we can see even today also there are even separate schemes also to promote ayurveda the roots are later vedic time period likewise vedic knowledge different vedic knowledge emerged 
to understand political setup if you understand mahabharata and ramayana you can get clarity what is the political setup monarchical system now you can see whatever is there now it's going to be almost uh, a permanent feature from now onwards monarchical hereditary crown became hereditary from single family one dynasty continuously rules monarchical hereditary assemblies when it comes to assemblies sabha samiti vidata gana they sabha samiti disappeared some disappeared others became weakened now kings rajan became very powerful became the rulers to legitimize their power they started performing sacrifices rituals like ashwamedha rajasuya ashwamedha ya sacrifice rajasuya vajpeya this kind of sacrifices so that they become very powerful now what is the purpose of these people to protect the territory instead of jana janapada became very important term in vedic period early vedic jana people were important now by this time if you protect the land automatically people are also protected janapada and continuously there were wars and battles to expand their kingdoms territory janapadas now to run that without strong taxation system it is not possible that's why taxation system like bali bhaga it became important bali sadaka became officers now when it comes to administration chief priest prohit senani bali sadaka they became important functionaries now when it comes to economy agriculture now by this time along with barley rice also grown they are called the, it as rihi and metal shama ayas black metal that means iron technology they used iron technology when it comes to pottery also painted graveware pottery various types of artisan works emerged chariot making various practice potters chariot makers blacksmiths iron smith various types of leather workers many types of artisan works emerged when it comes to society varna system in later vedic time period varna system became very rigid women conditions became very rigid now earlier they were allowing freely in sabha samiti vidata politically socially in rituals also 
they can choose their partners now restrictions they had to depend on male either father husband sons like that varna system became very rigid women ashrama system emerged ashrama system means during early stage brahmacharya next grihastha vanaprastha sanyasin so four stages of ashram from beginning of life to the end of life how the life should be there and in fact this social organization made many people leave grihastha ashrama enter into vanaprastha and sanyasin that in the later time period the sanyasin tradition emerged in the country when it comes to religion listen carefully here when it comes to religion many sacrifices so many sacrifices violence increased when violence increased brahmanical already ashwamedha sacrifice rajasuya vajpeya for different agriculture purpose different industry purpose trading purpose different different violence increased sacrifices increased earlier indra varuna agni they were the minor gods now vishnu shiva prajapati vishnu or rudra prajapati he is the creator of universe he is the protector preserver he is the destroyer so likewise now religious beliefs also entered into new stage within religion there are some sections of people who started questioning these rituals these ideas were recorded in separate books called upanishads upanishads already started questioning the violence and they were focusing on philosophical aspect they were continuously focusing on philosophical aspect what is the life who is god how this universe created so such kind of upanishads so like that even different uh, modern day epithets also like mundaka upanishad whatever indian emblem satyameva jayate it comes from mundaka upanishad likewise there are one or eight upanishads they are giving the purpose of life they question the importance of the violence this is how the later vedic time period now after later vedic time period now we have seen in politically monarchical system hereditary assemblies disappeared this gradually gave rise to different different kingdoms they are called maha janapadas whatever culture laid up to now it's almost going to be permanent feature now onwards different kingdoms will come different contributions now you can see here maha janapadas Sixteen kingdoms. By this time, by the time period of six hundred BC, sixteen kingdoms emerged. from here to here for example i am drawing only few things here magadha 
案が、コーサラ、グルー、パンチャラ、ガンダラ、カンボジ、アワンティアシマカデンディフレントリパブリックスライクワッジリパブリックシャキアリパブリック Some republics like Shakya Republic, and these are all monarchies. You can see here. Now, just to have a recap Paleolithic stage, then Mesolithic, Neolithic, Chalcolithic, Indus Valley Civilization. Migration, these ideas entered into different parts. Early Vedic, later Vedic, after that, different kingdoms emerged. Now, in these kingdoms, you can expect the Vedic ideas, Aryan ideas, as well as non Aryan, tribal, non tribal areas. And these are the 16 kingdoms. Now we know about this from Pali texts because around the same time, two great religions emerged in the Indian subcontinent. One is Buddhism, another one is Jainism. In addition to that, there are so many such religious ideas. They were called heterodox. So, Buddhism, Jainism, Ajivaka, Charvaka. You can see during later Vedic time period. This is the kind of religion, and this is the kind of society. Varna system, ashrama system, violence. In addition to that, trade also flourished. And once the trade also flourished, different urban areas emerged. Now, one more important fact here is first urbanization is Indus Valley civilization. This Mahajanapada period is also second urbanization. After a long time, you see, first urbanization is two thousand five hundred BC to seventeen fifty. After seventeen fifty, first urbanization declined. Indus Valley people declined. They migrated, but cities did not develop because early Vedic people they lived in rural areas. Later Vedic time period, they gradually urban areas did not develop, flourish fully. They were called proto urban areas, and by this time, second urbanization also started. As a result, different uh, trading activities. These traders don't want violence. Rulers, of, in the name of expansion, there were continuously violence, wars and battles. When wars and battles take place, trading activities will stop. For example, today, in the latest example, Ukraine war is going on between Russia and Ukraine. As a result, it affects trade between these two countries also at the same time in that entire region. And in fact, today, India. The、yeah, entire world is globalized. It is affecting every part of the world. This is how they don't want the violence. 
and shudras in brahmanical order brahmana kshatriya vaishya shudra this is how varna ashrama system varna system was there these two were enjoying privileges they don't pay the tax whereas vaishyas they pay the tax shudras they were paying with their labor labor tax forced labor brahmanical texts religious sanctions like shudras are there to serve the other three varnas religious sanctions are given like these three were dvija that means twice born fourth one ekaja only once born if they want to again take birth as human being they should serve the other higher varnas diligently so that in their next life they will improve their status and they will take birth according to their merit either in vaishya kshatriya or brahmana so today's brahmana kshatriyas vaishyas are enjoying this privilege because in the previous birth they have done good merit so this kind of religious sanction the religious ideas they propagated obviously vaishyas are not happy because they are paying the tax but not enjoying the status of varna they were given the third status and they are looking for the improvement in their status and the shudras also they were burdened with so many things that's why they are looking for other alternative under these circumstances buddha questioned this vardhamana mahavira questioned ajivika ajita keshakambali ajita keshakambali is this one makkali goshala before charvaka philosophy ajita keshakambali was there charvaka philosophy also known as lokayata philosophy these heterodox sects these are only four or five important sects around more than 60 plus so 60 plus such kind of religious ideas are there in india by this time period now you can see because of the existing brahmanical order opposition came they started the core principles of all these non violence and they did not give much importance to the existing varna system even though they could not completely destroy the varna system they did not encourage it as a result traders shudras many kshatriyas also patronized and in fact buddha mahavira they belong to kshatriya likewise now so much following came buddhism jainism started gaining momentum upsc they simply they will ask which of the following is a heterodox sect on the other hand <coughs> gradually by this time they are yet to take final shape but in brahmanical order itself sankhya yoga nyaya mimamsa vaisheshika vedanta these are called orthodox philosophies 
ಸೊ ಸಾಂಖ್ಯ ಯೋಗ ನ್ಯಾಯ ಮೀಮಾಂಸಾ ವೈಶೇಷಿಕ ವೇದಾಂತ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಟೈಪ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫೀಸ್ ವಿತಿನ್ ವೇದಿಕ್ ನಾಲೆಡ್ಜ್ ಸೊ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣಿಕಲ್ ಸ್ಯಾಕ್ರಿಫೈಸಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ದ ಕೋರ್ ವೇದಿಕ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಬೇಸ್ಡ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಪ್ಯೂರ್ ವೇದಿಕ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ಸ್ ದಯರ್ ಆನ್ ಟಾಪ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫೀಸ್ ಎಮರ್ಜ್ಡ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಡಾಕ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ನಾನ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಡಾಕ್ಸ್ ಹೈಡ್ರೋಡಾಕ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆನ್ಸ್ ಈಸ್ ನೋ ವೇದಾಸ್ ದೇ ಡಿಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ವೇದಾಸ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ಕೋರ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿ ದೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಗಾನ್ ಇನ್ ದೇರ್ ಓನ್ ವೇ ಬೈ ಡಿಸ್ಕಾರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ವೇದಿಕ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟೀಸಸ್ ಆರ್ ವೇದಿಕ್ ನಾಲೆಡ್ಜ್ ಬಟ್ ಸಮ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫೀಸ್ ದೇ ಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಟು ದ ವೇದಿಕ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಬಟ್ ದೇ ವೆಂಟ್ ಅವೇ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣಿಕಲ್ ರಿಚುವಲ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ವೈ ಆರ್ಥೋಡಾಕ್ಸ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ವಿತಿನ್ ವೇದಿಕ್ ಅಪೋಸಿಷನ್ ಟು ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣಿಕಲ್ ರಿಚುವಲ್ಸ್ ಔಟ್ ಸೈಡ್ ದ ವೇದಿಕ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಅಪೋಸಿಷನ್ ದೀಸ್ ಮಹಾಜನಪದಾಸ್ ಅಮಾಂಗ್ ದೀಸ್ ಮಹಾಜನಪದಾಸ್ ಮಗದ ವಾಸ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಪವರ್ಫುಲ್ ಒನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮಗದ ಇಟ್ ಪ್ಯಾಟರ್ನೈಸ್ಡ್ ಬೋತ್ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಜೈನಿಸಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಬೂಸ್ಟ್ ಟು ದ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಜೈನಿಸಮ್ ಲೇಟರ್ ದೇ ಬಿಕೇಮ್ ಪವರ್ಫುಲ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಮಗದ ದಿಸ್ ಮಗದ ಕಂಪೇರಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ದೇರ್ ವರ್ ಟೋಟಲ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಮಹಾಜನ್ ಬದಾಸ್ ಔಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಒನ್ ಮಹಾಜನಪದ ಈಸ್ ಮಗದ ಮಗದ ಬಿಕೇಮ್ ಸೋ ಪವರ್ಫುಲ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸರ್ಟೈನ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ದ ಲೊಕೇಶನ್ ಗಂಗಾ ರಿವರ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ದಟ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸಮ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಜೋಗ್ರಫಿ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಛೋಟಾ ನಾಗ್ಪುರ್ ಪ್ಲಾಟ್ಯೂ ಗಂಗಾ ರಿವರ್ ಇಯರ್ ಮಗದ ವಾಸ್ ಫ್ಲರಿಶಿಂಗ್ ಜೋಗ್ರಫಿಕಲ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ವೆನ್ ಇಟ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ಜೋಗ್ರಫಿಕಲ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ರಿವರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಮಗದಾನ್ ಕಿಂಗ್ಡಮ್ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ರಿವರ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಫ್ಲೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಆಸ್ ಎ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ ಅಗ್ರಿಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಫ್ಲರಿಶ್ಡ್ ಟ್ರೇಡ್ ಫ್ಲರಿಶ್ಡ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಸರ್ವೀಸಸ್ ಫ್ಲರಿಶ್ಡ್ ನಾವು ದೀಸ್ ರಿವರ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಪ್ರೊವೈಡೆಡ್ ಗುಡ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಪೋರ್ಟೇಷನ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಸ್ ಅವೈಲೇಬಿಲಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟರ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಅಲೂವಿಯಲ್ ಸಾಯಿಲ್ because of so many rivers alluvial soil forest area due to forest area magadha could utilize timber for army transportation building purpose and they are also close to minerals chota nagpur plateau in near bihar jharkhand rajmahal hills iron copper they utilized and we have seen the magadha region is present day bihar region heterodox sects were more popular the society was also liberal society was also liberal all these factors made 
Magadha continuously expand their territory and gradually from this part they expanded in all the directions. Different dynasties different people different rulers dynasties also encouraged it some dynasty names Haryanka dynasty Shishunaga dynasty Nanda dynasty Mauryan dynasty different people when it comes to Haryanka Bimbisara, Ajata Shetru, Kala Shoka, Nanda, Mahapadmananda, Mauryans, Chandragupta Maurya, Ashoka. All these people helped Magadhan Empire to expand in all the four directions. That's why by the time during 600 BC, it was a small kingdom, but by Ashoka time period, it became so big, almost entire Indian subcontinent, just by leaving the deep south, every part became part of Mauryan Empire. Now, one of the reasons, these are the factors, these factors can be statements in prelims. What is the reason behind it is not only about the rulers, it's about geographical location. When it comes to industrial revolution in Britain, some of the geographical locations helped Britain to become industrially developed country in the initial stages. Similarly, Magadha utilized the existing geographical factors and became very powerful. And now, around Magadha is growing. When Magadha is growing here, here, Iranian Empire, Achaemenid Empire, it is also expanding in all the directions. So when Magadha is expanding, Iranian Empire is also expanding. And this portion was also captured by Iranians. So this you can say, for the first time, Northwestern, Gandhara, Kamboj, some of the regions became part of Achaemenid Empire. And this part became 20th province of Iranian Empire. And it is one of the very fertile regions. Now you can see Indus Valley Civilization, urban areas, cities could emerge because of fertile soil. Now this fertility comparing with their lands is very, very high. That's why it used to give a lot of tribute. One of the richest provinces of Achaemenid Empire. And this side, Greeks. Greeks and Iranians both were fighting. After some time, Alexander, when Alexander came, he wanted to conquer all these territories and he wanted to reach India. Because by this time, Indians related stories are moving towards Greek lands through various authors. Some historians like Herodotus, who is considered as father of history. Many other authors who are writing about India, it gave inspiration to Alexander to reach India. And he has taken world conquest as the ambition, and he completely destroyed this. And by 326 BC, he reached here. Around the same time, Nanda dynasty was there, Dhananda was there. Already, internal revolts were happening. Chandragupta Maurya, under leadership of Kautilya, 
took the chaotic conditions and finally established Mauryan dynasty. After conquering this area, Alexander, here famous battle is Alexander versus Porus. Porus was the king near northwestern province. Ambi, he was one ruler. He submitted to Alexander, but Porus gave stiff fight. After conquering these areas, he went back. Finally, he died in modern day. Iraq region. After Alexander, these areas came under his generals. One of the generals is Seleucus Nicator. When Chandragupta Maurya established the authority here, here Seleucus Nicator was the ruler. Now we are entering into the Mauryan dynasty. Mauryan dynasty. So here, here some places you will get, you need to remember. Seleucus Nicator and naturally this is going to be the conflict zone between Chandragupta Maurya and Seleucus Nicator. Fight started, he was defeated. As a agreement, these areas became part of Mauryan dynasty. These areas were given there and to his court, Megasthenes was sent. So this Greek ruler, he was Greek ambassador. So Megasthenes, important for prelims point of view. Megasthenes was Greek ambassador to the court of Chandragupta Maurya from Seleucus Nicator. And in the end of his rule, Chandragupta Maurya, he left his kingdom. Finally, he came to Shravana Belagola. Where he performed Salekana, Jainism, under leadership of Badrabahu. So Badrabahu and Chandragupta Maurya came down to Shravana Belagola, present day Karnataka region, Mysore region, where he performed Salekana and left this world. Chandragupta Maurya. After that, Bindusara maintained good relations with neighboring countries. And after that, Ashoka comes. When Ashoka come, already by this time in society, so much schism was going on. Now, this is the time to give some references to Buddhism. Now, Ashoka is 268 to 232. Between this time, Buddha 483, he died. When he died, his principles, Ananda, Upali, two important uh, disciples were there. These two disciples, they have remembered whatever Buddha was teaching them. Ananda, he repeated what Buddha teachings were there. They were compiled in Sutta Pitaka in 483 BC. This was first Buddhist council. This was first Buddhist council. Upali, 
he gave monastic order disciples vinaya petaka sutta petaka means buddha's teachings vinaya petaka means the rules for monks this is 483 when he died after 100 years 383 bc second buddhist council was held this is rajgir this is vaishali now by this time already some kind of differences came within buddhist order buddha sangha buddhist sangha this led to maha sangikas versus theravada now gradually by ashoka time period 246 to 250 in between ashoka wanted to stop this schism and he wanted to bring all the buddhist people into one umbrella and he convened third buddhist council this is pataliputra and at this time he wanted he don't want the schism in the buddhist sangha and he wanted to bring all the philosophies different philosophies into one place so that a common ideology will come this ideology will become common to every buddhist monk this led to abhidhamma pitaka these are philosophical parts so many prelims mcqs are here just you understand the context in which first buddhist council was held second buddhist council third buddhist council third buddhist council ashoka now so much similarly in jainism also shwetambaras digambaras here when chandragupta maurya in his last days he went to shravana belagola before he went there was one reason also for this there was a famine when famine was there when it comes to jainism the principles which jainism jainist the monks should follow very extreme but when famine is there some people felt it is very difficult to follow those principles in strict during famine time period some people want uh, liberal principles some people wanted same old traditions under stola bahu shwetambaras emerged from badra bahu digambara so this is schism also in brahmanical tradition also already we have seen by 600 itself there was continuous opposition to the brahmanical order upanishads philosophy sankhya yoga nyaya they also started questioning the sacrifices rituals it led to so many sects within brahmanical order within buddhism within jainism and multiple ideas are there and ashoka wanted to have certain kind of common code of conduct for everyone he started dhamma ashoka dhamma one reason is for social stability another reason is political stability because his empire is very big his empire reached from north western part to deep south so from this area to this area this area to this area now here a different tribal people here different tribes here different so so many tribal people were there non tribal people 
ఆరియన్స్ నాన్ ఆరియన్స్ బ్రాహ్మణికల్ బుద్ధిజ జైనీస్ డిఫరెంట్ ప్రిన్సిపల్స్ దట్స్ వై ఈ నాట్ టు మేక్ సో మచ్ డైవర్సిటీ హీ వాంట్ టు బీ గివ్ సమ్ కైండ్ ఆఫ్ కోడ్ ఆఫ్ కండక్ట్ హీ పర్సనల్లీ ఎంబ్రేజ్డ్ బుద్ధిజం బట్ హీ డిడ్ నాట్ ఫోర్స్ హిజ్ సబ్జెక్ట్స్ టు ఫాలో ద సేమ్ బుద్ధిజం బట్ హీ గేవ్ జనరల్ కోడ్ ఆఫ్ కండక్ట్ దట్ ఇర్రెస్పెక్ట్ ఆఫ్ దర్ రిలీజియస్ బిలీవ్స్ ఆస్క్డ్ హిజ్ సబ్జెక్ట్స్ టు రెస్పెక్ట్ ది అదర్ రిలీజియస్ ఐడియాస్ so he said if you respect other religion that means you are doing service to your own religion if you hurt the religious sentiment of others that means you are hurting your own religion in that way he tried to give follow this code of conduct that's why mere ashoka later we call ashoka the great only very few rulers got this particular title the great so this is because of this kind of policies he followed ashoka he became ashoka the great and there are he issued it is like constitution he issued various rock edicts pillar edicts in different places some are minor some are major rock edicts some like maski minor rock edict small m means minor sopara major rock edict girnar major rock edict kandahar manshera i am writing only few places kalsi dauli jogada sannati various places he issued major rock edict and here he issued pillar edicts and these pillars were manufactured in a place called chunar from there he carried because this is ganga river they were very huge pillars very difficult to carry that's why he utilized natural transportation system mechanism rivers and he issued pillar edicts here major rock edicts minor rock edicts here and for ajivaka sect he donated certain caves also barabar caves so this barabar caves is the beginning stage of cave architecture in indian culture ajivaka barabar caves so likewise he started issuing edicts these are royal orders so that people will follow this he issued in brahmi script here issued in brahmi script in this area he issued in kharosthi kharosthi is the combination of iranian script plus indian script already greeks were also there greek script iranian aramaic script he issued then language wise prakrit language so in northwestern part greek language iranian language prakrit language in the mainland brahmi and prakrit this brahmi script was deciphered by james princep in 1837 he deciphered it when it comes to indus valley civilization had to be deciphered but when it comes to brahmi script james princep he deciphered it because of that we could understand what ashoka was trying to say in few places like maski 
His name Ashoka was there. In major rocket hits, there is no title called Ashoka. Only he was using the name Devanampiya. Devanampiya was the title he was using. But the name, real name Ashoka, is issued in Musky Minor Rocket Edict. After discovering Musky Rocket Edict, we come to know that all these inscriptions belong to Ashoka. So likewise, Ashoka tried to create a harmonious relationship among different diverse people. Even today also, we can learn many lessons from Ashoka. In part of sentences also, UPSC can ask a sentence, Ashoka Dhamma, or it may can be some of the places. You try to see RS Sharma, NCRT, old NCRT, new NCRT, at least see the images to look for geographical places. Now after that, Ashoka, after Ashoka, the successors of Mauryan rulers were very weak. By this time, once again, like earlier, Indus Valley Civilization, one of the theories says Aryan invasion. Because continuous in our history, we see such kind of invasions. Whenever northwestern borders are weak, these invasions are going to come. Now, once again, when here, Pataliputra was the capital, imperial capital, when a strong ruler was there, these areas were protected. Whenever weak rulers are there, these areas became very weak and it attracted invasions from all the sides. Iranian invasions during Mauryan Magadha time period, during Ananda dynasty time period, Alexander invasions. Now after Ashoka, once again now, Central Asian tribes, Shakas, Kushanas, they are going to come now. This we consider as post-Mauryan period. This is the post Mauryan period. We consider 200 BC to 300 AD, 500 years. Mauryan Empire disintegrated. Different here, Shungas, Satavahanas, Shakas. Kushanas, Parthians, Indo-Greeks, here, Karavela, Sangam age. Politically, it appears very fragmented. You can see so many kingdoms. But from the cultural point of view, this is one of the best phases. From trade point of view, one of the golden periods. Around this time period, here, Roman Empire. So when, in this area, This was the area. Now there were continuous invasions on one hand. As a result, so many kingdoms emerged. Around the same time period, this area was a Roman Empire. 
very powerful empire similarly in this side also chinese empire in this side also chinese empire around the same time period they constructed a wall also because these central asian tribes used to invade that side also chinese kingdom they constructed a wall so that they can protect from the continuous invasions because of that they used to come this side and here mighty mountains are there because of this they could not cross easily and they used to come this way here we have two important passes one is khyber pass another one is bolan pass two passes geographically khyber pass and bolan pass this side also continuous himalayan chain even though himalayas are there these passes khyber pass and bolan pass provided passes to the central asian tribes from the west asia even alexander also when he came he came from khyber pass and he went to outside india through bolan pass and whenever strong ruler was not there these areas are going to be very sensitive and invaders are used to come from this khyber pass as well as bolan pass now this is once again after mauryan empire became weak this side greek started greek invasions continuously came later shakas later kushanas parthians likewise one after the other they were coming keep coming they were established their independent kingdoms in the down satavahanas established they became very powerful almost 500 years they are going to stay here in sangam age chola chera pandyas chola chera pandyas they were there now these people were having continuous brahmanical tradition brahmanical tradition shungas pushyamitra shunga was the founder of shunga dynasty last mauryan ruler brahadrada was killed by pushyamitra shunga and established shunga dynasty he patronized brahmanical tradition he revived ashwamedha because during mauryan time period ashoka time period ashwamedha sacrifices all the sacrifices were not encouraged philosophy wise peaceful coexistence non violence was promoted once again when shungas came ashwamedha sacrifice revived brahmanical tradition one shungas satavahanas also promoted when it comes to satavahanas they patronized along with brahmanical tradition they patronized buddhism also when it comes to jainism karavela odisha he patronized different rulers when it comes to buddhism indo greeks patronized when it comes to kushanas shakas kushanas kushanas they patronized different type of religions secular policies were followed by now you can see even though during shunga time period brahmanical tradition revived a new turn called bhagavatism emerged 
this bhagavatism was patronized by indo greeks also so you can see whoever was there buddhism jainism brahmanical tradition entered into sangam period or sangam areas also so different regions different kingdoms by this time philosophy wise or ideology wise brahmanicalism was there buddhism was there jainism was there it is spread in different parts of the country now with respect to these strings certain facts are there these facts are going to be important with respect to prelims point of view for example shunga related to shungas there was one person called patanjali known for yoga in mahajanapada time period sanskrit grammar was properly organized by a person called panini astadhyayi or i will do one thing i will draw a map so that you will have better idea when it comes to panini he has written asthadhyayi this is during mahajanapada time period during mahajanapada time period now shungas were ruling here pataliputra or vidisha these were the places of shungas patanjali there was one sage called patanjali he has written commentary on panini's grammar this is grammar this is called mahabhashya from prelims point of view these names and their works are very very important patanjali commentary mahabhashya grammar here shungas now at this time there were indo greeks there was one ruler called menander and he was interested in buddhism he asked many questions about buddhism nagasena was the person who answered these questions and the conversation between these two became milinda panha now you see so many names will come milinda panha menander nagasena they belongs he belongs to indo greeks buddhism now here karavela he issued one inscription called hathi gumpa inscription this inscription provides details about karavela satavahanas during the satavahana time period so many buddhist caves buddhist caves and stupas amaravati stupa caves like kanheri bhaja ajanta caves also started the beginning beginning started during post mauryan period 
later wakatakas during wakataka time period the tradition guptas and wakatakas it is going to become more kaniheri baja nashik cave tradition when it comes to shakas there was a ruler called rudradaman rudradaman he issued girnar inscription this girnar inscription is the first sanskrit pure sanskrit inscription so you need to see pure sanskrit inscription shakas rudradaman so these are very very important uh, facts we need to remember about shungas pushyamitra shunga his son agnimitra was there about agnimitra during gupta time period kalidasa has written a book on him the book is malavika agnimitra malavika agni mitra this is how during this time period so many developments when it comes to sangam sangam literature developed tokapiyam it was the tamil grammar there were some epics like mani meghalai selappadikaram epics so tamil language so now you see language wise sanskrit is gaining ground prakrit pali language tamil language are gaining ground now when it comes to kushanas kushanas patronized buddhism kanishka fourth buddhist council kundalwan it is the place where kanishka by this time so many splits emerged in buddhism one became mahayana buddhism another became hinayana the split became official mahayana buddhism hinayana buddhism when it comes to dates the time when kanishka ascended the throne is regarded as 78 ad it is considered as shaka era even though there is debate about the exact timeline of kanishka 78 ad is considered as shaka era 58 bc is called vikram era so according to this here in ujjain there was a ruler called vikramaditya he dispelled the shakas because of that his era started called vikram era after vikramaditya later many people have taken this vikramaditya title for their prowess this is about post vedic post mauryan period after post mauryan period now you can see religion wise buddhism jainism brahmanism they were continuously in competition guptas after long time mauryans unified it later disintegration of polity once again after gupta when guptas came they unified 
more or less maximum parts of india the beginning is called gupta era 319 or 320 ad chandragupta 1 don't confuse between mauryan ruler chandragupta maurya chandragupta 1 he married a lichavi princess because vaishyas by this time now we are in 300 ad sharma some titles also emerged by this time varma gupta dasa sharma represented brahmanas varma represented kshatriyas gupta represented vaishyas dasa represented shudras chandragupta gupta in order to legitimize his rule he married from kshatriya princess lichavi princess established gupta era after that samudra gupta came samudra gupta he went for conquest he conquered so many territories in central asia in central india western deccan here foot hills of himalayas he conquered that's why he was also called napoleon of india he conquered it he was also a veena player he issued gold coins many gupta rulers issued gold coins after samudra gupta chandra gupta 2 comes by this time most of northern part became part of gupta empire and here vakataka was there vakataka kingdom chandra gupta married his daughter to vakataka princess as a result indirectly vakataka kingdom also came under guptas chandra gupta 2 he was also called vikramaditya because he also fought against shakas and shakas he defeated shakas vikramaditya 58 bc vikram era chandragupta 2 also defeated shakas he also took chandragupta vikramaditya one of the development about chandragupta 2 he maintained navaratnas in his court in ujjain some of them are because there is no exactly who are these nine gems no clarity but some of them are kalidasa he has written various works malavika agnimitram raghuvamsha మేఘదూత అభిజ్ఞాన శకుంతలం కుమార సంభవ సో లైక్ వైజ్ హీ హాస్ రిటర్న్ వెరీ క్లాసిక్ లిటరేచర్ సాన్స్క్రిట్ నెక్స్ట్ అమరసింహ అమరకోశ అమరకోశ ఇస్ ఎ డిక్షనరీ ఆన్ సాన్స్క్రిట్ దేర్ ఆర్ డిఫరెంట్ ఆర్కిటెక్చర్ ఆర్కిటెక్ట్స్ ఆల్సో సమ్ సైంటిస్ట్ ఆల్సో బట్ వీ డోంట్ నో ఎగ్జాక్ట్లీ దే ఆర్ అసోసియేటెడ్ విత్ navaratnas are not in general during gupta time period
Sudra ka. There was a poet. He has written Mrishya Kadika. We don't know whether he is associated with Navaratna or not, but in general, definitely he is associated with Gupta time period. Sudra ka Mrishya Kadika. Vishaka Datta. Mudra Rakshasa. Devi Chandraguptam. This is about Mauryan history. This is about Gupta history. Then with respect to science, Aryabhatta. Mathematician. Aryabhattiyam. So likewise, some important authors around uh, this time period. So you can track other developments also, just to go through NCRT ones. Don't leave new NCRT and old NCRT. At least go through the tables. You'll be able to identify some of the facts. But you try to see in the chronological order, Since beginning, now this I am just going to summarize it. So up to here, we are going to summarize. Even though it is flourishing here, now after Chandragupta II, weak rulers once again weakened the northwestern frontier. Huna invasions came. When Huna invasions came, once again disintegration of Gupta Empire. After disintegration, different dynasties emerged. Harsha in the northern part, Chalukyas in Deccan, Pallavas in south. These people became powerful and there is going to be power struggle among them after Guptas. So that we will see in the next class. To summarize completely, just First one, Paleolithic, Pleistocene area, Pleistocene era, continuously covered with ice. 10,000 BC, change in the climate, warmer, Mesolithic people. Later, agriculture developed, Neolithic. Different areas, different agriculture practices. And gradually, people started using copper, Chalcolithic. Gradually, this Chalcolithic area emerged into Indus Valley Civilization. It flourished and after some time declined. Next to Vedic people, early Vedic people here. Then they migrated to Gangetic Valley. This we consider as a later Vedic period. This gave new kingdoms rise to Mahajanapadas. One of the Mahajanapadas is Magadha. Magadha became very powerful and expanded into all the territories. By Ashoka, entire Indian subcontinent came under single authority. So Mauryan dynasty, very powerful one. After Mauryan's disintegration, once again, Shakas, Kushanas came. Indo-Greeks, Greeks, Shakas, Kushanas. This led to the disintegration of Mauryan. Different kingdoms, Shatavahanas, Karavela, South Sangam period. Later, Guptas came. Samudra Gupta tried to unify. They patronized arts also. Once again, after weakening Gupta Empire, Huna invasions, after Huna invasions, once again, disintegration. During this time period, Guptas, they also promoted 
ब्राह्मणिकल ट्रेडिशन continuously religious ideas are churning taking place one after the other initially brahmanical ideas very popular buddhism jainism emerged later in the form of bhagavatism buddha brahmanical tradition revived that is going to become very powerful during gupta time period however buddhism jainism continued to flourish up to gupta time period also and after gupta time period also buddhism jainism brahmanicalism all the areas are going to flourish here by this time christianity when jesus immediately after his death a saint called thomas he came to india at this time gondo fernas was there he was parthian ruler in the northwestern part of india he visited his court and from there he came to kerala some of the people in kerala accepted christianity as the religion even today also they are there still who had taken christianity during the time period of saint thomas and he went to present day madras there he died his tomb is there here likewise by this time period by 500 600 almost all major religions are there in india when islam is about to rise and after that islam also comes to india so up to here with this knowledge within this framework you can revise ncert your notebooks so that pick up all important facts as many facts as possible without any missings thank you thank you very much we will meet in the next class we will continue in next marathon session after post guptas onwards thank you see you in the next class